Dear Lord, thank you, Father. Always thanking you, Father, for the mystery and the glory of your word. Thank you for friends who care so much about it. And thank you, Father, for the freedom and the technology and the means to teach it and to share that teaching with many others. And I pray, Father, that the wisdom that you've placed here, we might just scratch that surface tonight and uh, understand important things that you've left there for us to know. Thank you, Father, for uh, the blessing that it is to be in a relationship with you through your Son, for the hope that it gives us in the face of life's trials, for the encouragement that we take from knowing you're in control of all things, from understanding that what we see and know in this world is not the end, it's just the beginning, and these things are passing. How much joy is there, Father, in knowing these things when the world faces uh, one trial after another without that hope. We can't imagine being in their situation any longer, and we, we have you to thank for the fact that we're not. And all of that was made possible by the events we'll study tonight, by the death of your Son in our place. Let us reflect not only on these events, but also on all that's come from them as a result of the grace they offer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In tonight's teaching, we conclude the trial of Jesus before Pilate, And then we'll go directly into the passion of Christ on the cross. We've reached that moment when Jesus is standing before Pilate. In your mind's eye, you might imagine the scene. He's bloodied. He's beaten. He's been whipped beyond recognition. Pilate has been trying to release Jesus since it's clear Jesus has done nothing wrong. And yet the crowd who's gathered at Pilate's place of residence in the city has made it clear they do not want Jesus released. They've been egged on by the Pharisees. They continue to insist that Jesus be crucified. This is a scene reminiscent of times when a crowd of sometimes young people will encourage that suicidal teenager standing on a cliff or on a bridge or something to jump, as crazy as it sounds, as heartless as it is. I I think this is something reminiscent of that same kind of bloodlust, that same kind of crazed group think. It's also evidence of the evil and the darkness in their hearts. Knowing how the enemy has been actively working to bring about this outcome from the beginning, that suggests to us that he himself in the spirit realm must have been tremendously excited and must have been at a fever pitch of activity with and among his demons. Can you imagine Satan's anticipation at putting Christ to death? Obviously, without the understanding of what was truly happening. There must have been a legion of demons moving in and around that crowd, working to bring about the death of Christ. If we could only have put on filters that let us see the world in spiritual terms in that moment, can you imagine what we would have seen, the demonic presence and the activity around there? And Christ certainly would have felt it and known it. Which explains why Pilate is so perplexed by the crowd's determination to see Jesus killed. How maniacal they are, how crazed they must have looked and sounded in the moment. In the end, however, we know it's the Father orchestrating these events through the agency of Satan and other men. Therefore, the enemy may be doing what he believes is best, and yet he's playing right into the Father's hands. So now we rejoin Pilate and Jesus in that moment, as they stand before this crowd. And as the scene continues, verse 5, Jesus then came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. At the emergence of Christ before the crowd, the call comes up from them to crucify him. Not even Jesus's horrifying appearance after all that's happened to him is enough to satisfy the demand for blood. And that's further evidence, I think, of their dark hearts and of the enemy's power in the moment. They have no rational explanation for wanting Jesus dead. He has not harmed anyone. He is not accused of any particular sin that's been proven. He hasn't broken any laws. He, he's done instead other things. He's healed. He's taught. He raised people from the dead. There's simply no cause here, and yet they continue to call for him to die. 
And Pilate, he's not a very sympathetic figure in this drama, nor should he be. He's a man easily manipulated, as you can see. He's timid. And in the end, he allows an innocent man to be murdered. Nevertheless, I think you can at least say he does seem to hesitate to agree with the crowd's perspective. We see him working here very hard to convince them that Jesus doesn't deserve the death that the crowd is asking for. In fact, this scene in John 19, if you were to count all the other gospel accounts putting them together, this is the fourth time that Pilate has attempted to offer freedom to Christ through the crowd. And each time the crowd rebuffs him. After this fourth attempt is rebuffed, Pilate responds to the crowd in disgust, saying, well, then why don't you guys go and crucify him? Because I'm not feeling led to do it. He's got no guilt. It's obviously an empty offer because the Jews would not crucify Jesus on their own. They didn't have the power to do it. Therefore, we know Pilate was merely speaking out of frustration. And that was a frustration because they wouldn't relent. They wouldn't show any sense in the moment. But what's truly important in Pilate's words is found at the end of his statement. Look what he says. Pilate, by his own admission, found Jesus guilty of absolutely nothing. Jesus is an innocent man, according to Pilate's judgment. Nevertheless, Pilate has not released Jesus as any judge should do when you face an innocent man in front of you. What he's done instead is beaten Jesus. He abused his prisoner within an inch of his life through a scourging. And he's done all of this even though he knows and he says Jesus is innocent of the charges. Pilate is undoubtedly culpable in Christ's murder. In response to Pilate's comment, the crowd responds that their law requires Jesus to die for he calls himself the son of God. The Jews are referring here to the charge of blasphemy, which was leveled against Jesus by the Sanhedrin. Under Jewish law, anyone claiming to be Messiah, but who was not Messiah, must be put to death. Jesus has been accused of this crime, and yet he's vindicated himself throughout three years of ministry. So even though they say he's claiming to be Messiah when he's not, everything Jesus has done has proven that he is. The people and the leaders have seen that evidence. Nonetheless, as John said at the beginning of the gospel, men prefer the darkness over the light. The motif of darkness and light explains an outcome that is otherwise unexplainable on the facts. There's a spiritual need to go against the truth, as all dark hearts do. And the crowd's statement that they would insist on crucifixion despite all the evidence to the contrary rattles Pilate's cage here all the more. And you notice the charge specifically gets him worried. The fact that Jesus was said to claim to be the son of God now has made Pilate extra concerned, right? Extra fearful. I suspect that fear comes from hearing that Jesus might be a God. Now, John doesn't mention Pilate's wife. But if you were to go to the other Gospels, you find out that Pilate's wife around this moment experienced a powerful dream, even as Jesus is on trial. And she's so disturbed by what she gets in the dream that she relays what she's heard to her husband through a courier, through some kind of messenger, in the middle of these proceedings. She interrupts her husband with that dream, which I doubt is something she would do on a typical basis. Her message had come to Pilate just before he offered Jesus and Barabbas before the crowd. So now imagine what Pilate must have thought at this moment. He's received a note from his wife telling him that according to the dream, she is to steer clear of this man who is righteous and to have nothing to do with him. Now, his wife could not have known what he was doing at that time. He didn't even know he would be doing this, right? This was something that was brought to him in an urgent way. She would have had even less understanding of the decision that Pilate was facing at the moment. There's not TV. She's not watching it on JNN back at home and (laughs) following the proceedings live. So he must have wondered greatly over how his wife could have had a dream so specific to the circumstances and then that relayed to him in the moment. So that's got him a little out of sorts. And now he hears from the crowd that this guy is claiming to be God. The Romans were pagans, as you know, and they were polytheistic. So they accepted the idea of multiple gods, including gods in the form of men, running around, ruling and competing with one another. And and they adopted a lot of the Greek mythology into their theology. And so the idea that Jesus might be a god was not something unheard of for Pilate. I certainly wouldn't have bothered Pilate in the way it did the Jews in that way. Ironically, Pilate is more comfortable with the potential of Jesus' claims than the Jews would be in this regard. So Pilate goes back inside now with these two pieces of data, this mysterious dream that seems very prescient, and then you have this experience with the crowd saying, this guy claims to be God. And so he goes up to Jesus with one question. He says, where are you from? Now, he knows Jesus is a Galilean. So he can't have meant 
tell me again what region of Judea you're from, because he's got that answer. He knows that. He's targeting a deeper question, a deeper issue. He's asking Jesus, have you originated in a spiritual world or from an earthly world? And in a roundabout way, what he's trying to understand is, are you truly a God? Interestingly, Jesus won't answer this question. Now, why is he willing to discuss other points with Pilate, but not this one? Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. Isaiah foretells that Jesus would be oppressed and that he would be afflicted in misery and injustice. And Isaiah says, as you probably have heard before, that he would not open his mouth in the midst of his circumstances. Now, you and I have seen Jesus speaking all along. He's spoken at every trial except for one. He speaks nothing to Herod. But other than that, he's spoken at all the trials. So why does Isaiah say that he will go through this process without, quote, opening his mouth? Well, clearly, he doesn't mean that Jesus won't say anything because we've seen that. So what he means instead is Jesus never undertakes an effort to defend himself against the charges. He goes to the cross willingly, in other words. He makes no effort to stop the mistreatment. He says nothing to exonerate himself. He takes no chance that in anything he says, it might shortcut the proceedings, stop the direction that it's going and toward the father's plan. Now, the questions that Pilate asked earlier didn't hold the potential to persuade him to release Jesus. They were bantering at best, and there was some mocking involved as well. But now the situation is different. Now you have a fearful Pilate who is sincerely wondering if Jesus is divine and Jesus clams up. He won't do anything to undermine the process at this point. He has to be crucified, and he's not going to let Pilate get in the way of that outcome. Can we even begin to imagine what that must have been like for Jesus? Because we've said all along he, he knows he's going to the cross. He's already been beaten to the point of disfigurement. He's already in unimaginable pain. He's got a lot more suffering to go, and he knows that. And he suffered all of these things while having the power to stop it at any moment. He's got that ability. And now you see him playing along in a way to ensure the proceedings continue. Jesus is innocent and undeserving of death. And yet on top of that, he has to actually work to ensure his own crucifixion. It's no longer a simply a matter of not stopping it. Now he has to permit it to go forward. So in verse 10, Pilate grows frustrated at Jesus's lack of cooperation. And so in amazement, he asks Jesus if Jesus is aware that Pilate is able to free him, that Pilate is his only hope. And clearly that's a rhetorical question. Jesus says, though, in response to Pilate's question, that Pilate's authority over him was given to Pilate from the father, from above. But you notice Jesus doesn't say Pilate has no power. That's a different statement. He doesn't say you have no power. He acknowledges that you have power, but it's come from a source, which means it's come with a purpose. And that purpose, coming from God, is to complete these proceedings to a certain outcome. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans that all government exists by God's hand and according to God's purpose. Even in those evil governments that do things we don't understand, there is still one or another way in which God is using it to good purpose in the end. Then, Jesus adds... That since Pilate is working under an authority given to him by God, his sin is not as great as the one who delivered Jesus to Pilate. Notice here that Jesus doesn't say that Pilate has no sin in the matter. He is talking in terms of degree. He is saying Pilate is sinning. He's just not sinning as much as someone else. And who is that someone else? Now, first, this statement indicates there are degrees of sin. Any sin is enough to separate us from God, but some sin is worse than others. If all sin is an offense to God and all sin qualifies for us to be set apart from God, if all sin has that outcome, then in what way are we saying one sin is greater than another? The answer must be in the punishment that it requires. That's the only thing left to distinguish one sin from another if all have the same effect of separating us from God. So if all sin puts us in hell, some puts us in worse places in hell than others, it would seem. That's the first thing you... You glean from this statement that Jesus makes. Secondly, Jesus offers Pilate a little consolation in the fact that he won't be in the hottest part of hell. He lets him know there's at least someone worse than you. It's been reserved for those who handed Jesus over to Pilate. Now, who is the one who received a worse punishment for handing Jesus over? Now, you might assume he means Judas, but technically Judas didn't hand Jesus over to Pilate. Not directly. And for that matter, the chain of custody is filled with a rogues gallery. You have the priest, to Annas, to Caiaphas, to Herod, 
and now to Pilate. And any one of them could be blamed in that regard for handing Jesus over. You could say the first guy gets most of the blame, but he couldn't have gone very far without the help of all the others. And therefore, I personally believe Jesus is referring to Satan. Satan is the ultimate authority behind Jesus' betrayal. He was inside Judas when Judas did as he did. And he's been working with the Jewish leaders, undoubtedly. And now he's influencing Pilate, we must assume. And so while Pilate claims to hold all the cards, he doesn't realize that he's a puppet being made to dance by a puppet master. And not even a warning from his wife will persuade him to do differently. So if Pilate has power to kill Jesus, it's only because God has chosen to use Pilate for that purpose. But the true power working in Pilate and the others to accomplish this outcome has been Satan. And yet even Satan is under the father's control, as John is showing us here. This is Jesus giving up his life for us in the face of a conspiracy orchestrated by Satan. So having gotten nowhere with Jesus in this conversation, Pilate returns to trying to persuade the crowd. Verse 12. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, it's Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. So they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he then handed him over to be crucified. Once again, the crowd's not going to relent. Finally, they happen upon the charge that Pilate can't ignore. And notice it's not a charge against Jesus. It was a charge against Pilate. The crowd said if Pilate doesn't crucify Jesus, then they would say that Pilate wasn't a friend of Caesar. They were threatening to essentially turn Pilate in as a disloyal leader to the Caesar. And that could have been fatal for Pilate, of course. So Pilate at that point is finished fighting. He sends an innocent man to his death. He has only his own interests in mind, not the cause of justice. Pilate comes out before the people with Jesus in tow, seats himself in a judgment seat. That seat in Greek is called the Bema seat. As you might know, Jesus has a Bema seat as well. Apropos, Jesus will sit on that seat while Pilate faces him. (laughs) Only it won't be called the, the judgment seat. It'll be called the great white throne judgment. In this case, Pilate's chair is seated in a place called the pavement, which is an area of paving stones, which formed a courtyard outside the Antonian fortress, probably where this is taking place. This would have been a place well known in John's day, even after the temple was destroyed decades earlier from when he wrote the gospel, that that pavement would have been there. Given this detail, it allowed John to give his readers in his day a point of reference that would have made these events all the more real. Uh, you know, a chance for you to go down and actually touch and see the place that is written about in this in this account. At the sentencing, as crucifixion is pronounced, John gives us an important time reference. He says it's the sixth hour on the day of preparation. Now, the sixth hour in Roman timekeeping would be 6 a.m., as it is for us today. Mark's gospel records that Jesus is placed on the cross at the third hour, which, according to the Judean method of counting, would have been 9 a.m. Between 6 and 9, you have three hours. Three hours for Jesus to be hauled off from this point where he's declared guilty and told to be crucified. For three hours, they take him away. They scourge him again. The second scourging is even worse than the first. Then he's given a cross, made to walk in his debilitated state some distance outside the city. Then he finally gets there and they have to put him up on the cross. That's a three hour effort from the time he's pronounced at six to the time he's on the cross at nine. The day of preparation is another important time reference. It refers to the day before a Sabbath. The day of preparation means a day used to prepare the home for the next day's Sabbath when you couldn't do any work. So you couldn't cook. You couldn't do a lot of the basic necessities that would have to be done if you wanted to eat on a day when you couldn't do any normal work. So this is a day of preparation, which means that we're on a day prior to a Sabbath. Why does John mention this? Well, I believe he does so to connect Jesus' death directly to the events of Passover. On the day of Passover, the sacrifice of the spotless lamb began at daybreak. Many thousands of lambs were sacrificed in the temple on this day. And so the work had to begin early. It would continue all day until mid-afternoon when the national lamb, so to speak, was sacrificed. That happened at approximately 3 p.m. 
That left just enough time for everyone to be at home and have their meal and finish it before sundown, which was the requirement. Everyone had to eat the last of the Passover meal before sundown on that day. So Jesus' death, the process of his death, takes place during the time between the sixth hour when he is sentenced to death until he dies on the cross at 3 p.m. This is the same period of time for the slaying of those Passover lambs. I think John is clearly demonstrating Jesus as the Lamb of God. While the people of Israel were preoccupied with sacrificing their lambs, the Father was at work sacrificing his lamb. John's reference to the day of preparation gives us an important clue to arriving at the specific day of the week that Jesus died. So let's review again what we find in Scripture concerning Jesus' death working backwards from what's provided in Scripture. First, Luke and Matthew tell us that Jesus was raised before sunrise on the first day of the week. Luke 24, 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So he's already gone by dawn on the first day of the week. Now, the first day of the week in Jesus' day is the same as it is for us today, Sunday. Matthew says the woman went to the tomb before dawn. And yet it was empty. So Jesus rose before sunrise on Sunday. Secondly, Jesus himself tells us in the Gospels how long he would have to be in the tomb. Matthew 1240, he says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He is describing his period of time in the grave in terms of successive periods of daylight and darkness. When he says day and night, he's not referring here to 24-hour periods. He's talking about nights and days. That's 12 hours of darkness, 12 hours of daytime, clearly. And not necessarily 12 hours in each case. He's not counting full 12-hour periods necessarily. Jews commonly counted any part of a day or any part of a night that is equal to the whole. So Jesus is saying he'll spend some part of three days and three nights in the grave. And, of course, those are successive days and nights. So all we have to do at this point is count backward to find the day Jesus entered the tomb, knowing he was out of the tomb before daybreak on Sunday. So the daytime of Sunday is not one of those periods. He was already out before that. So let's start counting. You got Saturday night as the one of the nights that takes you backward into Saturday day as one of the days. So I'll have days on one hand and nights on the other. How about that? So Saturday night, Saturday day, Friday night, Friday day, Thursday night, Thursday day. So he's in the ground Thursday before sundown, which was the requirement since it was about to become Passover. And that day is the first day of which he's in the ground. And then you keep counting three more. You end up at Saturday night. Sure enough, by Sunday morning, he's out of the grave. We find this confirmed in several ways. First, if Passover was a Thursday, then Wednesday night would have been the start of Passover. And that corresponds to the days Jesus spent in the city prior to his death. We know Jesus entered the city on the first day of the week, on a Sunday, which we commemorate now as Palm Sunday. And it says in the Gospels, he spent four days teaching in the temple, according to the Gospels. That period is important because it corresponds to the four-day period for inspecting the lamb, which is required in the law. So as it were, Jesus was in the temple teaching for four days, being inspected by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the priests. And they found no spot on him during that time. They found him spotless, as was required. So if he went into the temple, as we're told, directly from his entrance on Sunday, Sunday is the first day that he was in there teaching, the first day of inspection, and then Monday, and then Tuesday, and then Wednesday, he goes out from the temple into the Passover meal that night with his disciples. It fits the chronology perfectly. Secondly, the Passover always happens on the 14th of Nisan, which is time to correspond to a full moon. As you look at the astronomical calendar for the first century, there is only one Passover that fits this chronology. Jesus, we know, had to have been born no later than 4 B.C. because Matthew says he was born in the days of Herod and Herod died in 4 B.C. So the latest Jesus could have been born is 4 B.C. John said he began ministry at age 30 and died three years later, according to the the timeline of the gospel. So he had to have been age 33 when he died. Jesus died at age 33. So if he was born no later than 4 B.C., then that means he could die no later than A.D. 28 according to that chronology, and as it turns out, in A.D. 28, Passover occurred on a Thursday in that year. So you'd have no way to put a Friday death anywhere in the chronology for a Passover to fall in it during that week. John's reference to a day of preparation 
has led many to conclude that this day we're talking about now is Friday. This is where we get Good Friday from in our traditions. How is it then that it's wrong if we say this is a day of preparation and Friday normally would be that day, a day of preparation? Well, there's a second Sabbath in this particular week. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is by the law, by the prescription of law, a Sabbath day. God called for a Sabbath on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days, and it is the seven days that immediately follow Passover. This eight-day period of Passover plus seven days for the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the day of the Gospel writers, it had commonly become just known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Passover, all eight days being described by either term. But in truth, by law, it's actually two separate things, one day followed by seven days. And the day after Passover, therefore, is always a Sabbath day, because it's the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, in some years, of course, as this moves around the calendar, that first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread might happen to fall on a Saturday, in which case you have a Sabbath day falling on a natural Sabbath day, in which case you'd only have the one Sabbath day. But the rest of the time, if it fell on any of the other six days, that you're going to add another Sabbath day to that particular week. That was the normal practice. This isn't the only feast that has a Sabbath day. In fact, these days that begin feasts as Sabbaths are called high holy days or high Sabbath days, differentiating them from the weekly Sabbath day. So this is the day before a high Sabbath day. All the data points to a Thursday crucifixion and burial, which, by the way, illustrates how church tradition can supersede biblical truth Today, a large majority of believers are taught that Jesus died on a Friday, although the Bible plainly teaches otherwise. So as Pilate releases Jesus, he asks if he should crucify the Jewish king, but the leaders reply, they have no king but Caesar, which speaks more truth than they realize. They do not accept the Messiah as king. They reject Christ in favor of an earthly king. They would not accept God ruling over them. John makes clear that the Jewish leaders rejected Jesus as Lord and did so with malice, and those decisions would carry consequences for the nation. Jesus declares in Luke 13, 1335, Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase, your house is left to you desolate, that refers to the destruction, the ultimate destruction of the city and the temple in A.D. 70, That generation of Israel being judged in that way by God for their rejecting of the Messiah, their king. At this point, Pilate releases Jesus to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. John doesn't record Jesus' second scourging, but the other gospel writers do. As I said, this was even more brutal than the 40 lashes he experienced earlier. Many prisoners would not survive this torment and even make it to the cross. And of course, then you have crucifixion. Crucifixion is perhaps the cruelest form of death ever imagined. It's designed to prolong suffering. Leon Morris describes the process this way. He says, It was so brutal that no Roman citizen could be crucified without the sanction of the emperor. Stripped naked and beaten to pulpy weakness, the victim could hang in the hot sun for hours, even days. To breathe, it was necessary to push with the legs and pull with the arms to keep the chest cavity open and functioning. Terrible muscle spasms racked the entire body. But since collapse meant asphyxiation, the strain went on and on. This is why the seducula, which is the name given to that piece of wood that's put under the back of the person where they could sit a little bit on it or that it was put under their feet where they could stand on it, that was put there to prolong their life and agony because it partially supported the body's weight and therefore it encouraged the victim to fight on. John skips through all of this. The other gospel writers give a little bit of detail to it. John now moves to the events leading up to Jesus' death. In verse 17, it says, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him, two other men, one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Jesus goes out carrying the cross, as we're told. When John says Jesus went out, he means outside the city. This fulfills scripture, which said Jesus would be crucified outside the gates. And referring to the scapegoat, 
who Jesus obviously fulfills the, as, as a picture. Leviticus says this, Leviticus 16, 27. But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. So Jesus is crucified outside the camp in keeping with the requirements for the lamb to be taken outside. The exact place of the location, this place called the skull, Golgotha, that's debated. The name probably comes simply because of the frequency of executions that took place in this location during the first century. So there would have been a, a graveyard of people there, so to speak. There is no indication from scripture that it was a hill or a high point. That comes more from hymns than it does from scripture. Though it was common for Romans to crucify people in prominent locations so that everyone could see it, obviously, but that just meant putting them by a frequently traveled road, if nothing else. The location from tradition is at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is a site selected by Constantine's mother. Her selection was based on reports of locals living in the region whom she met when she visited the city in AD 326. There's some cause to believe that maybe in those couple of centuries the place would still have been known and she might have been referenced to the right location, but it's certainly unclear if that's true. A more modern suggestion that's come of late is that it's on the north side of the city wall where there's this outcropping in the hill that looks like a skull, but that was all dug in the 1800s, so that's completely conjecture. In any event, Jesus is nailed to a horizontal beam. He carried a single beam, a cross beam. When he gets to the place of crucifixion, they would have laid that down, nailed his hands to that, and then they would have hoisted him up and then dropped this on top of a vertical beam that was always there and permanently mounted. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is that they would have had that cross on the ground at the location. They would have then nailed him to it once it was on the ground and set the whole thing up sort of in a hole that had been dug and drop it in. And some have said that when that was done, at the moment the cross is dropped in, the body is thrown out of joint because of the force of it at that point. Then on the other side of Jesus, in either side, were the two thieves we aren't covering those here in great detail because John doesn't. The other Gospels do. And in our Luke study, you can hear a much more in-depth treatment to them. But it is interesting to consider that these two men were also subject to the same horrible punishment as Jesus, but in their cases, merely for theft, or as I say, merely. And it's also interesting that the threat of this horrible punishment apparently did not stop their thievery. You would have thought it might have been a great deterrent. That was the whole point, but not for them. It's irony that the same punishment Jesus endured wasn't enough to deter these common criminals from their thefts, which I think is proof that you need God to provide a solution to put an end to the cycle of sin and death. There's not a punishment great enough within humanity to break that cycle in us. Roman tradition required that above each condemned person's cross, there would be an inscription placed to identify the crime for which they are being punished. The purpose was to allow the convict's cruel death to serve as deterrent to others who would see it. In this case, Pilate faced an interesting dilemma. What do you write on the inscription of a man who's innocent? And so it was left to him to simply declare Jesus as king of the Jews. And he does it in three languages, Hebrew, Latin and Greek. Hebrew for the Jews, Latin for the Roman soldiers and officials. That was the official language of the Roman Empire. But Greek was the common man's language of the day within the empire. So the truth of Jesus's claims were declared to the entire world through all known languages in that region on top of his cross. And, of course, naturally, Jewish leaders object to this. They go out, make sure it's done right, see the sign, come back, complain. They were professional complainers. <laughs> they don't think it's a statement. They think it's a claim, and they don't want to see it reflected as a statement. And they tell Pilate he won't change it, of course. Here again, you see the sovereignty of God at work through the agency of an unbeliever. Pilate may have had his own reasons for what he wrote. Perhaps he was showing Rome's superiority over Israel by exhibiting their Jewish king crucified. But whatever he had in his mind, maybe he had no thought at all. Maybe it just came to him in a moment. Nevertheless, it was clearly God's intent that this sign read in this way for his purposes, regardless of what Pilate thought he was doing it for. And then Jesus hangs on the cross. Now, John's narrative gives attention to a number of details that are largely overlooked by the other gospel writers in the course of what transpires in these six hours. And there's a number of very interesting things here that you don't find in the other gospels. Verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part for each soldier and also the tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, well, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, 
the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Let's start with the soldiers. You have the soldiers dividing up Christ's clothing, probably very near. They're there to guard as well as to conduct the execution, so they wouldn't have gone very far. Now, it was a tradition in Rome for the executioners to receive the clothing of the condemned. The victim was always crucified entirely naked. I don't know what you've seen with the crosses you see in churches or on paintings, but if there's any sash there, that was added for artistic effect because... In reality, Jesus wore absolutely nothing. That was part of the shame of the event. So all those who were crucified were entirely naked on the cross. In this case, his clothing consisted of what we're told of five items, which would have meant probably things like his footwear were included, head covering, outer clothing. And the soldiers, four of them, each claimed one of those items, leaving just this tunic left over. The tunic is the undergarment, usually sewn together from sections of fabric. In that case, had it been separate sections sewn together with seams, then you would have expected that The four soldiers would have torn it to each get a section of it. But in this case, his tunic was a single woven piece of material. So they decided rather than try to rip a garment that isn't going to rip very easily, let's just gamble to see who should receive it. John points out this moment is a fulfillment of scripture taken from Psalm 22, 18. And in fact, I encourage you to go back as homework and read all of Psalm 22. It is an amazing description of crucifixion from the perspective of the condemned from the perspective of the one on the cross, which is interesting for two reasons. First, it was written, Psalm 22 was written centuries before crucifixion was ever practiced. So clearly it's looking uh, prophetically into the future. But secondly, it's the only description that exists of what crucifixion is like written from the perspective of someone who's experienced the event because it's always fatal. Only God who controls the future and survives death could write such an account. So while the Romans cast lots, Jesus is attended to by a group of women. Now, when you look across all four of the Gospels, you find that there were four women present. John mentions Jesus' mother, Mary. Matthew, Mark, and John mention Mary Magdalene. John mentions another Mary, the wife of Clopas. This seems to be the same Mary who is the mother of James and Joseph, mentioned by Matthew and Mark. And then John mentions Mary's sister, Salome, who is the mother of Zebedee's sons, which includes the Apostle John. Last week, you may have heard me mention that John was a cousin of Jesus. Here's how we find that out. So standing with these women was John. So John is standing there with his mom, and the mom of John is Jesus' aunt, and Jesus' mother is there. And to picture this scene, I don't want you to imagine Jesus lifted up high. This is another of the Hollywood errors. Uh, Jesus is not way up off the ground. In fact, his feet might not have been more than a few inches off the ground. There's no reason to lift them up any higher than it takes to get them up on a cross. So they don't go to any extra effort to hoist them up 10 feet off the ground. The cross is very low. In fact, you notice later when we see it that the soldier can pierce him without standing on a ladder. He just steps up and pierces him. The point in this is this is a much more intimate moment between victim and crowd than is often portrayed in the movie scenes. So Jesus gathers his breath and tells John to take charge over his mother, Mary, which means John would have had legal responsibility to care for Mary after his death. That's very important because as the oldest son dies, the mother is in jeopardy without the husband still alive. Now, you might ask, well, what about all of Jesus's living earthly brothers? Well, it would make sense that Jesus would choose John over his natural brothers because John and Mary were believing in Jesus, were believers, while at this point in time, Jesus' earthly brothers are not believing in him. That reminds us that from God's perspective, our relationships in the body of Christ take precedence over our earthly relationships. As Jesus said in Luke 8, 21, but he answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. So as we said earlier, Jesus hangs on the cross from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m., which is a total of six hours. The number six in Scripture is the number for sinful man. And as Paul points out in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He hangs on the cross and he dies in place of sinful humanity. And friends, even that number six, when divided in two, becomes important. The first three hours of the cross, three being the number of divinity, represents Jesus experiencing the curse of sin. 
Think about what happened in the first three hours. He's exposed to the painful consequences that sin requires. He's treated as a criminal. He's mocked. He made plans for his own death with regard to his mother, something else that sin forces us to consider. The fact that all men die is something we must prepare for. All of these things Jesus suffered are things that only come upon a person because of sin. Yet Jesus suffered them without cause, for he had no sin of his own. So he became sin, as it were. He took our place and then endured things for the first three hours that were consequences of sin. Now, the second three hours on the cross were a period in which Jesus experienced the wrath of God against sin. Now, John does not record it, but the other gospel writers tell us that at noon, the world experienced three hours of intense darkness all the way until right before the moment of Jesus' death. That darkness enveloped the entire earth, according to Luke. Records from other ancient cultures reflect this truth, including Niogenes in Egypt, who wrote that the solar darkness was such that either deity himself suffered at this moment or sympathized with one who did. Obviously, he spoke that under the influence of the spirit because both were true. Other such records have been preserved, and they all note the exact timing and length of the darkness upon the earth and correspond to the same time and length as this event. Some of those descriptions speak about being able to see the stars of the night during that time. So, you know, that would have been something worth recording. These are the three hours in which Jesus experiences separation from the Father, which is the definition of spiritual death. For three hours, the Messiah experienced spiritual death on the cross. In the other Gospels, we see Jesus crying out to the Father during this period, asking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fulfillment of Psalm 22, 1, the cry reflects the fact that he is for the first time ever separate from the father. At this moment, he experienced spiritual death, which is a separation from an intimate relationship with the father. In fact, this is the only time Jesus ever addresses his father as my God in all the Gospels, which reflects that for this time they lacked the paternal relationship that he had known until that moment. This is the moment that God had never yet previously experienced. And the depths of that experience will, thankfully, never be ones we know ourselves by the grace of God. We'll never know what it feels like to be separated from God as he was. Now, consider this. Jesus' spiritual death preceded his physical death, just as it is for everyone. Adam's spiritual death preceded his physical death 900 years plus later. Spiritual death comes at the moment of sin, and for all of us born into it, we come into the world dead in sin, And Adam died in the moment he ate of the fruit. Spiritual death is the penalty for sin, as Paul taught in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. But physical death is the consequence of the curse on the earth. So Jesus died, spiritually speaking, at noon. He was forsaken by God, as will be the case for all who die under the penalty of sin. He died the second death in our place so that we'll never experience that second death. We'll never know the separation that he knew. But because Jesus had no sin, the father could also be just in restoring fellowship to his son, which the father does right before Jesus' death at 3 p.m. In our experience, it's exactly the same way. If we are to know the father, we must know him before our physical death. So we have our spiritual death first, then our spiritual rebirth then our physical death afterward. Jesus follows this pattern. He comes back into the relationship with the Father right before his death on the cross. You see that in John 19, 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill Scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, you notice in verse 28, Jesus said, everything has been accomplished. What he means is, in other words, the work of redemption has been completed at that moment. Jesus's spiritual separation from the father ended at that moment. Jesus is no longer subject to the wrath of God at that moment. He endured it for three hours. It is now finished. And you notice Jesus said he is now thirsty. Now, remember the response of the rich man in Luke 16 when he found himself separated from God in the afterlife? 
Luke 16, 24, he cried out and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so they may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue for I am in agony in this flame. His first request of Abraham was for a drink as well. So it's significant that following his time of spiritual separation, Jesus' first request is for something to wet his mouth. It's also significant that scripture always presents God's mercy and grace as water to quench thirst. How desperately must the lost desire the relief when they are under this judgment. So the drink Jesus receives is sour wine or vinegar, we would say today. Vinegar was a common drink. It may have been something that the soldiers had there, like we would have Gatorade. They had vinegar sitting nearby. And Jesus receives it here in fulfillment of Psalm 69, 21. Once again, John includes this detail to stress Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. But there's also a practical reason why he may have requested it. He's about to say two very important things from the cross. And if his mouth is so dry he couldn't speak, then he needed the vinegar to wet his mouth. Those statements were the ones recorded here. The one of them that you see here, it is finished. And another of those that's recorded elsewhere in the Gospels. In both cases, they reflect the end of a process by which the creation is redeemed from sin and the curse. If Jesus' separation from the Father ended before his physical death, then why does Jesus die at all, much less spend three days in the grave? What's being accomplished by that step of the process? First, notice how Jesus dies. In verse 30, we're told he gives up his spirit. In other words, Jesus brought himself to death. The cross did not take Jesus' life. Jesus handed over his spirit to the Father, which is the other significant statement that you don't see mentioned here. Jesus says, into your hands I command my spirit. So no one, literally speaking, no one took Jesus' life. He died voluntarily. In the other Gospels, as I said, Jesus is recorded as saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But notice even in that statement, once again, Jesus is back to calling God his father. So before the darkness, father, during the darkness, my God, after the darkness, father, again, indicating that spiritual separation had ended and he was now one again in the relationship he had with the father. Since Jesus had no sin of his own, he would never have died no matter how long he had hung on that cross. As we just learned from Romans 5, the cause of death is sin. And there was no sin in Jesus, so there was no cause for his death. So physical death is the product of the curse made necessary because of sin. Jesus was not under sin and was not under the curse, having been born of a virgin. So he bore the curse for our sake. Therefore, his physical death was of his own accord in taking the place of of us in receiving the curse for sin, though he had no sin of his own. So what was the benefit of his physical death was in satisfying the curse, even as his spiritual separation satisfied the penalty for sin in the earlier phase. Again, we follow the same pattern. The unbeliever is dead in their sin already, already separate from God and strangers to the promises of God, etc. And their physical death follows that in keeping with the curse, just as it did for Adam, though Adam was redeemed before he died. What was the benefit of Jesus' time in the grave then? Well, his time in the grave was not a period of restitution or punishment in which he takes our place in hell. Some have come to think that or at least assume that. Some say Jesus must have gone to hell to be tormented there in our place for three days. Well, that is not the teaching of Scripture. First, his atoning work was finished on the cross just as Jesus declared in verse 30. It is finished. The Greek word here, by the way, Four finished. It's often found marked on invoices from that period dug up in ancient records. And in those cases, it means account paid in full. That's what the term in Greek means. Secondly, if Jesus were to take our place in hell, he would need to spend an eternity there for that is our sentence. Right. Third, scripture says that the wrath of God was satisfied in the death of Christ alone, which occurred on the cross. Paul says in Romans 5:10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So it's his death that reconciled us. Fourth, Scripture never says Jesus experienced any torment while in the grave. On the contrary, Scripture says Jesus was spared from the misery of Sheol in Psalm 16, 9 and 10. Therefore, my heart is glad And my glory rejoices, my flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. So Jesus could not have gone there 
for our sake to replace us, because otherwise he'd still be there. Secondly, he's not suffering. Thirdly, he didn't need to do it to pay off some debt that was already paid on the cross at his death. Why is he spending any time then in the ground for three days, as Paul says? His time in the grave was intended to accomplish two things. First, for three days, he proved he was truly dead. There was a saying at the time or a belief at the time that the spirit of the deceased used to hang around the body for at least three days. We covered this when we talked about Lazarus, remember? And so if someone revived within three days, it was considered a natural event. Not that there had been any precedent for that, but that's how they came to believe. So by putting three days distance between his death and his resurrection, it took away any chance someone might deny the truth of what had actually transpired. So it was there for practical reasons. Secondly, it's there for prophetic reasons, for it fulfills the prophecy of Jonah, that he would be three days and three nights in the grave. So it fulfills that prophecy. Thirdly, Jesus had to go into the shield to preach to the souls waiting there for the Messiah and set free those saints held captive and awaiting the Messiah's atonement. If you were a saint before the resurrection of Christ and died, you were kept in a place of comfort, but you couldn't go to the throne room because without the atoning work of Christ, you were not eligible to enter there. No one would be resurrected before Christ. Paul said he is the first fruits of the resurrection. And therefore, it awaited Christ's death and resurrection for the rest to follow. And they were held in a place of comfort called Abraham's bosom in what is, from Luke 16, known as the good side of Sheol. Jesus goes down there, according to Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 3. He goes down and preaches to the saints that were there, both to the side that is unbelieving and to the side that was believing. And he sets free the believing. Uh, he didn't preach to convert. He preached to witness against. Therefore, as John says, the process of atoning for sin was finished. At the moment of Jesus' earthly death, he had experienced three hours of separation from the Father, and now he suffered the penalty of the curse in our place. And those things cumulatively were sufficient to atone because the Father's wrath was appeased by those things. That's why we say his death was a propitiation for our sins. Propitiation, fancy word for saying the appeasing of someone's wrath. And what do we say is the propitiation for sins? Death, just the death of Christ. So now there must be a burial and one done in haste. Verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says they shall look upon him whom they pierced. Once again, John mentions that this is a day of preparation prior to the Sabbath that marks the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Notice John says this Sabbath is a high day. Here's one of your clearest indications yet in Scripture that we're talking here not about a normal Sabbath, but about a Sabbath that comes as a result of a feast day. And John is very clearly specifying that so that we understand this is outside the normal Sabbath. It's not considered proper by Jews to allow a body to hang on a cross over the course of a Sabbath. So the Jewish authorities want to rush this process along so they can get these men buried before sundown. And remember, it's not just one Sabbath awaiting them. It's two because you're going to have the normal Sabbath right after this high holy day Sabbath. You're going to have two Sabbaths in a row. So for 48 hours, you can't do anything with bodies. Interestingly, that will preclude anyone from visiting the grave of Christ between the time he's put in it until the time he resurrects. And so therefore, they go to Pilate. They say, let's break the legs of the prisoners. Now, that might seem harsh, but it is actually merciful. It hastens their death without the legs to push their body up, they aren't able to breathe, and so death would come quickly after the legs are broken. Pilate evidently agrees, and the soldiers are directed to break the legs of all three. This is typically done by means of a large, I know you want to know this, this is typically done by means of a, a large iron bar, which the soldiers would just swing at the shins and break them. As the bones break, the person would slump down, and within a short time, they would asphyxiate. The two thieves on either side of Jesus, they have their legs broken, because apparently they're still alive, which resulted, by the way, in Jesus' promise to the one thief that he would be in paradise that day. Well, that was no guarantee in a, in a crucifixion. You could hang there for days. But Jesus was proven to be true in his words. Then John says in verse 33, they reach Jesus, but they see he's already dead. And therefore, they don't have to break his legs. Just to be sure he's dead, 
A soldier pierces his side with a sword. Here again, proof that he couldn't be very far off the ground. Out comes blood and water, John says. Now, various explanations exist for what John saw, including various natural explanations for why you would see bodily fluids resembling water escape from a thrust of a sword up into the uh, pericardium and so on. The importance, though, is not that. It's not the physical explanation for why this could occur, though it certainly has explanations. It's the picture that's created concerning the meaning of Christ's death. And you notice John footnotes this comment with this interesting statement in which he says, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth. It's sort of an interesting thing to add out of the blue in the middle of this one statement. But if you were to compare what John says here to what he says in his first letter in 1 John 5, where he says our Savior is saving us by means of blood and water. In 1 John 5, 6, he says this, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. And there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So here you have a combining of a statement of water and blood with the truthfulness of a testimony. And back in John's Gospel, the very same thing. Water and blood and then the truthfulness of a testimony. John is telling us that the Savior saves us by means of blood and water. He speaks of himself in verse 35 as saying he has seen these things. He is telling the truth. And he echoes that by explaining these events are all to testify that Jesus is our sacrifice for sins. That this is the water and blood that saves us. Water being a picture of spirit, blood being a picture of the atoning work of Christ. This scene is also recorded to demonstrate fulfillment of other Old Testament scriptures. Specifically, Christ's death without broken bones completes the picture of the Passover lamb, which is required to be a lamb that has no bones broken as a part of being killed. It also fulfills Zechariah 12, which says the Jewish people will pierce their Messiah and later look back upon that with regret. Lastly, John covers the burial. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus, who had come first to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So, with Jesus confirmed dead and the Sabbath fast approaching at sundown, they got to do something to attend to his body quickly. So, at this point, two secret followers of Jesus come forward to claim the body and bury him. And this was an incredibly risky step by both of these men. Notice that none of the 11 apostles come forward to claim the body of Jesus. They probably feared that anyone who would publicly be identified with Jesus would share his fate. And that was probably a good bet, although it didn't obviously go that way. The first of those to come forward is Joseph of Arimathea. From all the Gospels, what you learn about this guy is he is a righteous man, a good man, a wealthy man, a believing Jew. And he comes from a town uh, called, as you see, Arimathea, which is about 21 miles northwest from Jerusalem. This is the same city, by the way, where Samuel the prophet lived and is buried or was buried. A legend grew up in the first century church that Joseph became an evangelist, traveled to England, founded the first Christian church outside Judea in Glastonbury and is buried there. Joseph was also a member of the Sanhedrin council, as was Nicodemus. This is the same Nicodemus from chapter 3. And John in a bit of a uh, moment of sympathy and appreciation for Nicodemus, mentions that this is the same Nicodemus who previously came at night. And in contrast now, the point is, what he did in the earlier days when he was too afraid to be known as the follower and was hiding and coming at night and secretly, now he and Joseph do the exact opposite of that. They take tremendous risk. They act in a bold way, probably at the risk of losing their careers at this point, by publicly being identified as a follower of Christ. So in the short three years since Nicodemus came to know Christ, he has returned now from the man who would not be known to the man who would do the most risky thing. Quite a testimony. They claim the body. They bound it up in strips of linen and spices hastily. They placed the body in a new tomb, which we must presume was one that had been constructed for Joseph's eventual burial. And it being Joseph being a rich man, that would make sense here because Joseph made a significant sacrifice in burying Christ in this tomb. 
tomb. This tomb is said from the other Gospels to be hewn out of rock. That's a tremendous amount of labor. That was the most expensive form of burial you could have. The cost I've seen estimated to do such a thing in that day is similar to the price of a small house today of, of value in terms of what it took to make that tomb. And Joseph willingly gave up that wealth to the Lord and his obedience was the fulfillment of scripture because Isaiah 53, 9 says Jesus's grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So he has the rich man's tomb. What's really interesting is because of his obedience, he had his wealth returned to him. Three days later, he gets his tomb back. So next week, we'll look at the resurrection of Christ and at the extensiveness of Jesus' appearances after his resurrection. All right. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, that uh, you can give us this clear understanding of what was required to take the penalty for our sin. We don't like to reflect on these terrible events more than necessary, and except, Father, that it is important that we understand what sin requires. For as Jesus said himself, for those who have been forgiven much, they love much. And we know, Father, just how much had to be done to save us from our sin, just how terrible sin is and the penalty that it forced upon Christ, Father. So we must love much, knowing what he has done for us. And we thank you, Father, for that reminder. Let us finish this study next week, and perhaps with new friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.